This is Power Hour with Gabriella Power. Hello and welcome to Power Hour. I'm Gabriella Power. Former US President Donald Trump is back in Pennsylvania for the first time since his assassination attempt. He's vowed to keep rallying while paying tribute to the father and retired firefighter Corey, who was tragically killed in the shooting. No, they, uh, they did an amazing job. And we have, by the way, we have the doctor, one of the great doctors was uh, there. He worked on Corey, actually. He was, Corey had a hard time. Corey, Corey is special. Thank you, doctor. Appreciate it very much. Great. Overnight, chilling new footage has been released of the moments leading up to the assassination attempt, where you can see the shooter moving around on the roof minutes before Donald Trump was shot. <laughs> It's been almost three weeks since Trump was shot in the face. And how is it that we are getting new evidence and details from reporters and whistleblowers, yet the Secret Service cannot reveal a thing about what went so horribly wrong that day? This is what the new acting Secret Service director had to say at a Senate hearing. Whistleblowers tell me that, in fact, law enforcement were stationed to be on that roof and that law enforcement abandoned their post because it was too hot. Is that accurate? Senator, I have heard that as well. Uh, again, uh, they posted up inside. And I think moving forward, as I, as I said earlier, we're going to ensure that state and local counter snipers are on roofs. But, but do, you, do you know if someone was supposed to be on the roof? Do you know if someone was in fact? That's what the whistleblower tells me. That may or may not be accurate. Do you know that to be the fact? Was somebody posted to the roof, local law enforcement or whomever? Uh, I do not know that to be a fact. Well, can I ask you why you don't know that? I'm also told that local law enforcement suppliers offered the Secret Service drones and you declined them. Is that true? So, Senator, uh, one, I've been very transparent and forthcoming. Uh, there Your agency was... has not been transparent and forthcoming, so please, but... let's not go there. The drones. Thank you, Were Senator. you offered drones? Senator Hawley. So there was an offer to fly a drone on that day. And why did you deny it? Uh, again, uh, I think the ability of local law enforcement to provide an asset, we probably should have taken them up on it if, we, if it was offered. Is it just me, or does it actually get worse every time we hear from the Secret Service? Now, there's less than 100 days to go until Americans vote for their next leader, and sadly, we're at the point where politics is getting ugly. And I'll get into what Donald Trump has had to say about Kamala Harris in just a moment, but I want to start with J.D. Vance, because recently an old clip of Donald Trump's running mate has resurfaced, describing Democrats as childless cat ladies. We're effectively run in this country via the Democrats, via, via our corporate oligarchs, by a bunch of childless cat ladies who are miserable at their own lives and the choices that they've made, and so they want to make the rest of the country miserable too. Now, at the risk of stating the obvious, those comments are stupid. They're insulting, and to be honest, I understand why comments like those make people want to just switch off altogether. But it's important to remember that this is a soundbite from years ago that has been specifically selected by the mainstream media for you to hear without the context of what he actually had to say on the issue of children and the declining birth rate in America before he made those comments. A lot of people are unable to have kids for very complicated and important reasons. Uh, there are people, of course, for biological reasons, medical reasons, that can't have children. The target of these remarks is not them. It's important to, to point that out. It is one thing to recognize that there are people who don't have children. It's one thing to recognize that there are people who don't have children through no fault or choice of their own. But it's something else to build a political movement invested theoretically in the future of this country when not a single one of them actually has any physical commitment to the future of this country. Oh, what's that? He has empathy and understanding for women who may be in a position where they cannot have children. Yes, he does. So before we jump on the bandwagon of how evil J.D. Vance is and how Kamala can do it all because she is a woman, can we just take a moment and take a look at what he is trying to say and what he's trying to achieve here? Because although this may scare some in America, he actually wants the U.S. to become a country where women and families are better supported to have children. The birth rate is plummeting in America, and that is a problem. 
As well as the women who are choosing not to have children, there are plenty of women around my age who want to, and despite having a great career, they feel that they can't, and they feel that they can't afford it. And that is a failure of the government. So was J.D. Vance wrong to make those comments? Of course he was. But do those comments from J.D. Vance make him a racist? Well, according to this MSNBC commentator, although J.D. Vance's wife is Indian and his three children are biracial, he only wants white children in America. The stats are there. More and more Americans choosing not to have kids, which again emphasizes why J.D. Vance's comments right. about childless Americans, childless cat ladies, right. could be so politically damaging. Well, so what's interesting is this is this natalism that comes from an authoritarian playbook, right? That there, there need to be more white children, right? That's the idea that there's, you know, this is about great replacement theory racism, right? This is what this is. So don't misunderstand it for him wanting more children. He wants a certain kind of, you know, racist Thing. Let's bring in journalist Brad Palumbo. Brad, great to be with you. It just scares me how many people are listening to this kind of commentary and believing it. All of a sudden, J.D. Vance is a racist. No, that's one of the most deranged and unhinged commentaries that I've heard on MSNBC in a while. And to be honest with you, that's saying something. I mean, to say that he only wants white kids in when he has natalism policies where he wants to promote child rearing and increase the birth rate is absurd. He's never had anything about those policies that's limited to white children. And he literally has biracial children. Mm. As you mentioned, his wife is Indian. His kids are of mixed race. He is a family man, and he's never given any indication that he only cares about increasing the birth rate of white families or anything like that. So that's a pretty vicious smear to throw around at somebody. And it's a really unfortunate one because I agree with you that there actually is some substantive pushback for some of what J.D. Vance has said, but they seem determined to misconstrue his remarks in the most disingenuous way possible. Absolutely. I actually... I actually do disagree with him, a part of his argument where he essentially argues that people who have children are better suited to wield political power because they're more likely to consider the long-term interests of the country because he says they have skin in the game. I'm not sure I buy that, to be honest with you, because okay. some of the greatest leaders in American history, like George Washington, had no kids. And frankly, we've been governed for decades now by people in their 80s with kids and grandkids who don't really seem to give a darn about the nation's future. But instead of kind of discussing these remarks on the substance, we're getting these out of context sound bites that are misconstruing his remarks. I don't think he ever really intended to slight women with fertility issues. That seems like a very bad faith interpretation of his remarks. And then just the unhinged commentary on MSNBC. They're just determined to take anything a Republican politan politician says and twist it to a totally absurd extreme. And as you say, instead of making a conversation about the substance, we have this reaction from people out in the streets. I'm a childless cat woman, but I'm happy. I'm happy. <laughs> Bring laughter on. What do you say to Vance? Yeah, what, what is your message to Vance? <laughs> You're happy. Ah! <laughs> you don't mess with cat, uh, childless cat ladies. <laughs> I don't even know what to make of that. <laughs> what do you think, Brad? Did she, did she just hiss at us? Yes, she did. <laughs> I don't like this. This makes me feel uh, concerned and slightly unsafe. I mean, look, you're not... I, I think the childless cat ladies remark from J.D. Vance was an unforced error. He shouldn't mm. have said it, but it was years ago. But to be honest, you're not beating the weird cat lady allegations when you're going out in public with a cat mask on and growling or hissing at reporters. I mean, I'm not sure what's going on there, but it really does seem like American politics is becoming this game of ping pong where they, we just bounce off each other and become more and more hysterical each time yeah. we exchange responses. Seems to me that's a little bit of what's playing out here. Absolutely. Now, the media is going into meltdown and no doubt Donald Trump is right now being accused of being a racist because he made these comments about Kamala Harris's heritage. I've known her a long time indirectly, not directly very much, and she was always of Indian heritage and she was only promoting Indian heritage. I didn't know she was black until a number of years ago when she happened to turn black and now she wants to be known as black. So I don't know, is she Indian or is she black? She is always but identified you know as a black woman. I respect she went to a historically black one. college. I respect either one, but she obviously doesn't. 
because she was Indian all the way, and then all of a sudden she made a turn and she went, she became a black person. Just to be clear. Now, I understand why people may hear those comments and everyone screams, you can't say that. But Kamala Harris has made race and gender the biggest part of her election campaign. It's her strongest selling point that she would become the first black woman uh, in US history to become president of the United States. So we've been hearing this from her nonstop. But back in 2019, this was the messaging from Kamala Harris. Okay, so what we're going to cook today okay. is well, an Indian recipe. Yes. Because yes. you are Indian. Yes, yes. Okay, and okay. I don't know that everybody he knows that but I find that wherever I go and I see Indian people at the uh -huh. supermarket on uh -huh. the street everyone's like you know Kamala Harris is Indian right it's like our the thing we're so excited about <laughs> to have you running for president yeah so we're both Indian, yes. but actually we're both South Indian. Yes, um, you look we, like the entire ha one half of my family. Okay, thank you. You do. I've been telling people you we're do. related already, yeah. so this is uh -huh. perfect. It's basically <laughs> true. Uh, and so were you raised eating South Indian food? South Indian food. Brad, look, I think the comments from Donald Trump are not going to help him, but I do think that he reserves the right to criticise her campaign strategy, and she has made race part of her campaign strategy. Yeah, she certainly has. And I think there's some context to this conversation that's important. I watched the entire event that Trump mm -hmm. did with these black journalists. And from the very get go, it was incredibly hostile. They came at him really strong. I do give him some credit for honestly going there because he was very much going into the lion's den. And then the question he was asked that actually prompted this unfortunate response <laughs> Uh, is was one of, is Kamala Harris a DEI candidate? And some Republicans are saying that. And he actually declined to go along with that idea, even though I actually think that'd be a more defensible position because Biden basically said she was a DEI candidate and said he was only considering women for his vice presidency and strongly favoring women of color. So they have made identity a huge emphasis. They go, they're absolutely drunk on identity politics, the modern Democratic Party. But I do think think that Trump, this was an unforced error because Kamala Harris can be biracial. She can be both Indian, half of her family is of Southeast Indian descent, and half of it's of Jamaican descent, which is considered black. So she can be both. It may be true that she's emphasized the Indian side of her identity more, but mm -hmm. Trump almost seems to be suggesting that she's like an Elizabeth Warren or like somebody who's pretended to be an ethnicity she's not. That's not the case. And now everybody's talking about that rather than the other parts of this event where I thought Trump actually acquitted himself very well in an incredibly hostile environment. Yeah, we'll just keep getting those sound bites from Donald Trump on repeat for the next few days and then some probably dangerous commentary uh, from some media outlets. But let's look at Kamala Harris's priorities because we touched on J.D. Vance's priorities and that is to make it easier for families to raise the next generation of children in America. But Kamala Harris... Well, she wants to make sure that prisoners have taxpayer-funded trans surgeries. And there was a specific case. And when I learned about the case, I worked behind the scenes to not only make sure that that transgender woman got the services she was deserving. So it wasn't only about that case. I made sure that they changed the policy in the state of California so that every transgender inmate in the prison system would have access to the medical care that they desired and need. For prisoners, Brad, top priority? No, I mean, this is not a good way to be using taxpayer dollars. It's really quite something to be pushing that. I mean, look, I believe America is a free country. Adults mm. should do whatever they want. But ultimately, if you want those kinds of surgeries, you should pay for it yourself. You shouldn't force it onto taxpayers, especially not if you're literally behind bars because you've committed transgressions against society. The idea that they should be entitled to the full suite of gender transition surgeries and all that stuff, which is quite expensive, is pretty ludicrous. It's pretty far left, progressive, bonkers town, California style liberalism. What it's not is very palatable to a general election public, which is why those remarks are being recirculated. And the other thing I'll say is that this is a weak spot for Democrats because we are literally at a point, I don't know what it's like in Australia, but we're literally at a point in America where they are housing biologically male inmates in women's prisons, mm. including in cases where some of those individuals are committed, are, are, are being imprisoned for violent acts or even sex-related crimes. 
that's insane. I understand that maybe you need to have a separate ward or accommodations for inmates who identify as transgender, but putting violent, biologically male criminals in women's prisons is a recipe for disaster, and it's something that nine out of 10 Americans think is absolutely nuts, I'm sure, if you ever polled such a question. Yet that's the record that places like California and the policies embraced by the progressive flank of the Democratic Party have to run on on these issues. So I think that's an enormous uh, liability for them because it just strikes anybody with a bit of common sense as absolute madness. Absolutely. And it's not pro-women. Look, I want to talk to you about another fear tactic that's being used by the left-wing media, and that is to connect Donald Trump with Project 2025, something that Donald Trump has repeatedly distanced him himself from, and he's described it as extreme. I don't know what the hell it is. It's Project 25. He's involved in Project... And then they read some of the things, and they are extreme. I mean, they're seriously extreme. But I don't know anything about it. I don't want to know anything about it. But what they do is misinformation and disinformation, and they keep saying, he's a threat to democracy. I'm saying, what the hell did I do for democracy? Last week, I took a bullet for democracy. Project 2025 leader Paul Danz has stepped down as the Harris campaign continues to falsely connect this project to Donald Trump. But will this be the end of it? No, I don't think it will be because they've decided that this is a good poll tested attack against Donald Trump, but it's a really bad faith smear because Trump has condemned this Project 2025, this pretty radical conservative agenda from the Heritage Foundation uh, here. He's condemned it in extraordinarily strong terms, unlike I've seen him condemn many things, honestly. He's not a big condemner, but he's gone out of his way over and yeah. over again to distance himself from this project because some of the ideas is in it are very radical and very unpopular. But they want to tie this to him, even though he's put out an actual agenda, a Republican Party platform that is the Trump platform that people can go look and the most controversial parts of Project 2025, like banning abortion medications, like banning all pornography, those things are nowhere to be found in Trump's actual platform. Yeah. So it seems to me to be deeply unfair to judge a candidate and assign to him blame and responsibility for this is what he'll do, Project 2025, when he's vocally repudiated it over and over again and also put out a separate agenda that is quite different in many of the key and most controversial policies. Now, it's true Trump has some ties to it. Some of the people involved in creating it worked in his White House, and the Heritage Foundation is an influential conservative group. But people who understand politics understand that there's always activist groups creating agendas and mm. white papers and trying to push them in the background. It doesn't mean those ideas are going to all see the light of day or even that most of them will. It's purely aspirational. So. These ideas, uh, some of them I think make a lot of sense in this document, some of them I think are a little bit Looney Tunes, but ultimately you can't pin them on Trump when over and over again he said, I don't support this, but that is what mainstream media is doing. And it's the kind of thing that they would so quickly call misinformation or disinformation or even call to be censored if it was conservatives or Trump supporters that were doing it. But because it's to take down the guy they really don't like, I guess any any. Any means uh, are justifying any ends in yeah, their mind. Yeah, absolutely. Facebook can uh, classify that iconic shot of Donald Trump with his fist in the air after getting shot as uh, misinformation. It's, of course, I uh, corrected that, but it's it's absolutely insane. Look, just when we thought we couldn't get uh, it couldn't get any more embarrassing for the Secret Service, it has. My question is, why don't you relieve everybody of duty who made bad judgment? So, yeah, you're right. I am zeroing in on somebody. I'm trying to find somebody who's accountable here. And we so will... you're telling me that the person who made the decision not to include this in the perimeter has not been relieved of duty. What about the person who is in charge of the interoperability of radio frequencies between local law enforcement and, and Secret Service? Has that person been relieved of duty? Uh, no, Senator, because interoperability is a challenge, uh, is a greater challenge than just one person. On that day, we had a counterpart system uh, it failed As the person who decided, who made the decision to send Donald Trump onto stage knowing that you had a security situation, has that person been relieved of duty? No, sir, they haven't. Because... As the person who decided not to pull the former president off of stage when you knew that, in your words, the locals were working a serious security situation, has that person been relieved of duty? 
Uh, no, sir. Again, I refer you back to my original answer that we are investigating this through a mission assurance and as opposed to zeroing in on one what more do you need to investigate to, to know out exactly what, the what more do you need to investigate was. to know that there were critical enough failures that some individuals ought to be held accountable i mean what more do you need to know it just it gets more and more upsetting the more i watch it three weeks on no answers are we ever going to get some answers from the secret service not unless we hold their feet to the fire, clearly, because if anybody with common sense was running these agencies, heads would already have rolled. But the people involved in this epic security failure have not been fired, the people that actually made the bad calls. And that's just the kind of thing you'd never see in the private sector. I mean, if this was a private company where this had been where they had had this kind of failure, I think people would have been fired on the spot the very yeah, next day. Absolutely. The entire security division would have been replaced but they can continue to, I guess, just cash taxpayer checks and, and pedal on in their, their bureaucracy. And there might not be real accountability unless we hold their feet to the fire, because this is a bloated and clearly dysfunctional institution, the Secret Service. And gosh, I mean, we all got so lucky that that bullet missed by just a couple of inches because the, of course, you know, you just, first of all, don't want to see a man killed, a, a man with a family. But secondly, mm -hmm. the absolute chaos our country would have been thrown into, the risk of political violence, of instability, everything. We were so close to the brink. It's genuinely, honestly, I, I, so amazing in a sense that that bullet missed because the horrors that our country would have experienced, I, I can't put them into words, to be honest, if it had gone differently. I think it would have been extraordinarily dark for America. So we got incredibly lucky because there were all these security failures. And at the end of the day, tragedy did occur, of course. Uh, some people were killed and hurt yeah. and many people were traumatized, but it could have been so much worse. And the fact that we're not getting heads rolling and actual accountability. I mean, we did, of course, get the Biden appointee to step down after enormous pressure who was leading the agency, but it should be way beyond that. There should be way more. I mean, this is the kind of thing that should never, ever be acceptable. But in a bloated government bureaucracy where they can just cash tax, taxpayer checks all day, I guess they can, They think they can get away with this, but it's really Absolutely. something. And it's really scary. There's still a few months left to go until November 5. Who knows whether there's going to be another attempt? Hopefully not. Um, you know, the other point to make is I just think it's so brave to see Donald Trump up on stage back in Pennsylvania. He took a bullet and less than three weeks he's back rallying. Anyway, we've got those pictures that we'll show you to you later on in the program. But before I let you go, Brad, Kamala Harris is holding a marginal one point lead over Donald Trump in a new Reuters Ipsos poll. The poll found that Kamala Harris is supported by 43 percent of registered voters and President, uh, former President Donald Trump is supported by just 42 percent. Well, why is she all of a sudden so popular? I would love to get your thoughts. But uh, do you think this honeymoon period is going to last, Brad? No, I don't. I mean, back when she ran for president in 2020 under her own presidential campaign in the Democratic primary, she originally was doing quite well. She had big leads in a lot of the polls. She was kind of the media flavor of the month. But as the campaign went on, her really just being very bad at politics came out and was on full display. Her many gaffes, her flip-flopping on policies, uh, all of that became clear, and she plummeted and eventually dropped out before the Iowa caucuses. So her campaign went up in flames. She's having a bit of a moment. It is a honeymoon phase right now. The media has switched overnight and is all in lockstep about praise Queen Kamala, but her vulnerabilities will become clear. She has a quite radical record. In 2019, she was rated as the most left senator uh, in the U.S. Senate. She's got radical positions on everything from fracking to transgender issues to abortion to many other things that will haunt her. All of this, the attack ads are being written right now. So I would expect her to come back down to earth in the polling and for this race to really tighten up in the coming weeks because she's having a little bit of a bump now, but I think it's a sugar high and I, mm. I do think there's going to be a crash soon. We will wait and see. Brad Palumbo, so great to join you. Uh, speak with you, I should say, on Power Hour. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thanks. We have a very special guest with me in the studio for what is a Sky News First. 
David Stevens, also known as David the Medium, is Australia's most famous psychic and medium who has made countless accurate predictions, including predictions about the US election. Just to name two, at the start of the year, David predicted there would be an assassination attempt on Donald Trump and that Joe Biden would step aside. David, thank you for joining Power Hour. Thank you so much for having me on. Pleasure to be here. It is brilliant to speak with you. Let's start with the US. It's been a wild few weeks. It's been unprecedented what has unfolded. What do you see happening with Kamala Harris? We've got the DNC coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, will the honeymoon period wear off for Kamala Harris? Or what do you see when, you, when you're looking at Kamala Harris? Yeah, it's very interesting with Kamala Harris because her whole rise uh, through the Democrat Party has been one that has been very sort of stage managed, especially on her end as well. With the DNC coming up, I do believe that there won't necessarily be any uh, sort of uh, arguments over who they're going to select as their candidates. Uh, I believe it will be a very sort of straightforward vote. Uh, but the honeymoon period for her is wearing off. Um, Already. All fortunately, I'm ready for her because, unfortunately for Kamala Harris, she is sort of a deeply unlikable character. Mm. And the more that uh, the general sort of uh, American population is able to sort of view not only what she's about but also what she says, there's a lot of her history also being brought up as well. Uh, so I think for her it would be very wise maybe not to get in front of a camera in an unstaged sort of press conference situation. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to see a bit of a sort of a change in public opinion there. Well, the Democrats have been very good at hiding uh, their leaders b b uh, away from press conferences. So they did mm. it with Joe Biden for years. So mm. let's see how many press conferences Kamala Harris gives. But what do you see when it comes to Kamala Harris and Donald Trump if they end up debating? How will that go? I mean, it's very interesting because even when I look at that, I don't necessarily see them having all-out debates. I mean, it is going to be very sort of stage-managed behind the scenes as well. But I think in a lot of ways, Kamala Harris would probably repeat her uh, debate that she had with uh, Mike Pence in lead-up to the 2020 election. Uh, it's not going to be very policy-based. There's not going to be much substance behind it. It is going to be very sort of separated into... Uh, sort of personality traits and sort of, you know, social roles, more so than actually debating public policy or debating what mm -hmm. the parties are about. Uh, but I, I, I still don't really see them debating each other properly. So it's really? really interesting to see what comes up there. OK, we'll wait and see. Look, Donald Trump is continuing to rally despite uh, getting shot in the face mm. just a few weeks ago. He's back in Pennsylvania today. Is he safe? Is there going to be another assassination attempt? Well, unfortunately for Donald Trump, in the lead-up uh, to 2024, I did predict that there would be two assassination attempts that would sort of target him directly. Unfortunately, as we saw in recent weeks, there has already been one. But I do believe that, especially over August and September, Donald Trump really does sort of enter a bit of a red zone again. I think there is more of a higher risk over the coming weeks to months in particular uh, that we could see sort of another an assassination attempt on him. I don't necessarily believe that it will be at an outdoor rally style like it was uh, with his first attempt. Uh, I think that there can be sort of special interests that could be also paid to uh, vehicular movements, plane movements uh, and sort of larger scale sort of accidents. And you see that quite soon? Not, we're not looking at November, we're looking in the next few weeks and months. If it is likely to happen, I do predict that it would definitely be over the August, September period. What about Kamala Harris? Is she safe? Yes. She's fine. <laughs> OK, OK, well, that's good. We want both candidates to be of safe, of course. Look, I want to get your thoughts on how the media's role looking at this election campaign. Facebook has actually acknowledged that censoring the iconic image of Donald Trump with his fist in the air mm. after he was shot, they censored that image and now they've acknowledged that censoring that was a mistake. Why, why is that happening? As we're all very well aware in the media as well, and in terms of even the spiritual implications of it, it is all very stage managed and there is sort of a narrative of what they're sort of telling as well. Now, obviously, with Donald Trump's rise in popularity again, especially over the last few months in particular, there needs to be sort of countermeasures that sort of uh, negate that within the general population. So they don't necessarily want the... Uh, authentic message of what Donald Trump represents to be sort of widespread and also... That image of him uh, post-assassination is iconic. And that Absolutely will go, iconic. Exactly. That will go down as one of the most iconic pictures of this century. So it's what it instills within everybody when they see a photo like that because it does really re-engage them with not only what Donald Trump represents but also that real fighting spirit of how uh, the general American population will view them representing him as well. Mm.
and that is obviously a threat uh, not only to uh, the DNC and the Kamala Harris's uh, candidacy and her uh, campaign, but also to the general sort of mainstream media that really is more so sort of left-leaning that we definitely see in the United States. Yeah, it's interesting. I just, I, it's, it's so wild when images like that, images that the world saw in, in real time and then for them to, to censor it just doesn't seem like the smartest image to censor, but look, they, they tried. And you see, this is the Barbara Streisand effect again as well, the Streisand effect, because the more that they do try and censor information, the more that people are actually drawn into finding it. It's natural for humans to... 100%. ...be drawn into what we're censoring yeah. and, and seeing. Yeah, and humans don't like being lied to. And humans and they, don't like that. And they often can tell when they're being lied to, which is... <laughs> We've already seen the picture. Like. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> We've seen the picture. It's a little bit too late. It's a little bit late. But they tried. OK, I've been dancing around this, but we obviously want to know the big question. US election, who's going to win? Spirit, when I've always looked into this, has always said that Donald Trump would win twice. And this has gone back as, uh, as far as 2015. So I definitely uh, was very much behind him in 2016 and predicted a, an election win for him then. Uh, I do believe that the 2024 elections is Donald Trump's... Uh, favour. in It's definitely the ball's in his court right now as well. So the next few months in particular, as we all can imagine, are going to be very fluid. There's going to be a lot of sort of surprises that are going to be coming up. There's going to be a lot of change in uh, sort of what we're being presented with. But I do believe that Donald Trump will become uh, the victor from the 2024 election. I wasn't sure what you are going to say. That is very interesting. Are there going to be some gaps from Kamala Harris? What, well, what do you, else can you tell us that we might see between, between now and November? Yeah. Well, sort of as we were mentioned before, Kamala Harris is a very sort of stage-managed character. There mm. is a lot of smoke and mirrors behind her as well. So uh, the DNC and also her campaign managers are going to be very sort of wary about putting her up in front of a press conference. I mean, we even saw recently that she hasn't been in attendance uh, for some uh, larger functions, especially uh, with uh, the Black Journalists Association this morning even. So I think... It really is very interesting to see what will happen with her. I think if she is given the opportunity to speak, even in the, the debate setting, if that does eventually occur or not, uh, she's not necessarily a character that can speak well in public. Uh, when Donald Trump goes off tangent, we see some of his best work really coming out. Kamala mm. Harris is the polar opposite of that. So uh, I think she is going to be pretty gaff-prone in the lead-up to the election as well. A lot of her history will also be brought up. A lot of her ascendancy mm. into the Democrat Party will be brought up as well. And that doesn't work in her favour. OK, look, I could talk to you about the US election <laughs> for hours, but we, we do have to move on. There's been a significant development in the conflict in the Middle East in the past 24 hours with a Hamas leader being killed. What do, you, what do you see when you look at the conflict in the Middle East? Yeah, well, again, I mean, this does lead into one of my other predictions for 2024, which was a rise in a lot of sort of assassinations of world leaders and uh, strong political figures as well. So when we're looking in, into the future of uh, the Middle East, especially the near future as well, I mean, with the recent assassination, as you mentioned, of uh, Hamas chief uh, Ismail Haniya, uh, you know, it really is on a tentalk. So the Middle East in general, as we all are very aware, is a very fluid situation. Uh, I do predict that Iran will uh, strike back on Israel, whether that's a direct attack on the Israeli state. Uh, we may also see targets of uh, soft targets throughout the world even as well. I think there needs to be special attention also paid to the Olympics as well, with not only Israeli visitors but also the Israeli athletes. Mm. Uh, but I don't think it's really going to be that far away until we do see a response from the Iranian state. Uh, and in terms of uh, broader conflict in the Middle East as well, I think, uh, you know, even recently the Australian government has warned Australian citizens to again leave Lebanon. Yeah. Uh, so we are going to see, and it is also a prediction of mine again, a, a wider conflict again with Hezbollah, uh, the Lebanese uh, militant group. So obviously there was a rise up there with the Israeli-Gaza uh, conflict in October last year. So, you know, Israel and... Lebanon have been in conflict uh, in a very minor state since that moment. But I do believe, especially over August and September, we will see a sort of a more broader conflict coming in there as well. Uh, the head of Hamas in Gaza, Sinwa, and also the head of Hezbollah, uh, Hassan Nasrallah, uh, I would say would be very much at the top of the target list for assassination as well. Do you see them being assassinated? Uh, inevitably. Inevitably. Yeah. You can't say how soon? If I was them, I wouldn't be sleeping well, put it that way. OK. Yeah. Can I get your thoughts on China and Taiwan? China and Taiwan's always been a very interesting topic for me as well. Uh, I think 
again, with American weakness on display in terms of foreign policy, but also their military capabilities as well, uh, China and Taiwan really does come into the focus point there as well. I've always predicted, especially over the last sort of 12 months in particular, that uh, it will be inevitable that we will sort of see a form of conflict there as well as uh, China does pull Taiwan back into its uh, satellite influence. Uh, I don't necessarily predict that that would occur this year as well. Again, it's very dependent on the outcome of the American election. Uh, but I think inevitably, especially in this decade, we will see uh, a, a form of conflict again in uh, Asia there as well. OK. Look, you are in Sydney not just for Power Hour, but you are hosting your sold-out live show at the Opera House. Let's take a look. It is this Sunday and I am so excited. What can we expect? Well, first and foremost, I'm so glad uh, it's not only happening, but you're able to attend as well, Gabrielle. Very so honoured. Uh, what can we expect? Uh, doing live shows is something that I've wanted to do for a very long time. And I have been a professional psychic medium for coming on eight years now as well. But uh, for everyone in attendance, I want them to witness firsthand uh, the connection with spirits and... Uh, I will be drawing on my connection with spirit in the afterlife to pass on messages of love, support, validation and guidance to members of the audience at random. Uh, and it's going to be a special evening. I'm very much looking forward to it. What is it like for you? Because I have been in the audience before and it is hard to describe. There is nothing like it. But it, it's quite beautiful, some of the messages that come through. You provide mm. such comforting messages because all of us have, have lost people that we love. Mm. What is it like for you holding space for that many people? Yeah, it really is something that has become a, a highlight of my career. I mean, I just get such enjoyment from it. I get a real peace from it as well. I mean... Whatever spirit feels, I feel as well. And they're always coming forward with, you know, happiness and love and really wanting to connect. Uh, so in a lot of ways, it leaves me on a high. And I, it's just something that I love being able to do. And I, I love being able to allow the audience to witness that as well. So I'm very much looking forward to it again. Oh, I cannot wait. Finally, before I let you go, is there any advice from spirit that you can share with us, especially the, the last half of 2024? My biggest message for the rest of 2024 in particular, especially because it will be a very fluid, constantly evolving, I mean, there's going to be a lot of big events that are going to be occurring uh, for the next sort of six months. My main advice is if you can't control it, don't allow it to control you. Mm. We just have to remember, at the end of the day, this is basically like watching a movie. So sit back, relax. The movie's been wild. The movie's <laughs> been intense and there's been a lot of plot twists. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> sit back and relax and enjoy the show. David, thank you so much for coming on Power Hour. Pleasure to be on. Thank you so much. Iran's Supreme Leader has issued an order for a direct attack on Israel in response to the killing of Hamas political leader Ismail Haniyeh. There are reports that Iran will respond with drone and missile strikes. Joining us is former Labor MP Michael Danby. Michael, thank you for joining us. How significant Thanks, is Gabriel. the killing of this Hamas leader? I think it's um, crucial um, that Jerusalem owned up to the killing of the Hezbollah leader in Beirut, um, but they don't want to provoke the Iranians into a uh, military attack like they did in April, remember, with the 300 missiles, by owning uh, the uh, attack in Tehran. It, it was to send a message from Jerusalem to Hamas that... Um, 70 years after the Second World War, if you kill a whole bunch of Jews or Israelis, um, the people who organise it are not going to get away with it. But also important, Gabriel, was the uh, message to um, Iran. If you continue to use all of your proxies all around the Middle East, Hamas, Hezbollah, Houthis, all funded by Tehran, all funded by their oil revenues, uh, selling cheap oil to the Chinese because the Americans don't impose their uh, oil sanctions, um, we can get you. And what a, what a time to send it, the, uh, the day where the Prime Minister, the new Prime Minister of Iran is being sworn in. And um, Hamas, uh, look, it's, it's right out of that uh, great uh, TV spy series that's just been out the last few years called Tehran. 
the poor Iranians must think that the Israelis are all over um, Iran. They're, they're behind every corner. Remember, Gabriel, they stole the entire nuclear archive from a warehouse, put it in trucks uh, and drove it out of the country. I mean, uh, if you were a leader in Tehran, you'd be uh, worried after that assassination of uh, mm. Hamas. Are you concerned uh, about the, re the potential retaliation? Um, I think the Israelis dealt with it um, previously with uh, American, French and UK help. Um, but that was a direct missile attack. I think uh, if it had been an Iranian in um, Tehran, they, there might be a more comprehensive military attack. But unfortunately for Hamas, they're Sunni Muslims and they're regarded by the Shia um, incumbency in Iran as dispensable. So I, I think there'll be some perfunctory military response, but not... Uh, a wide Middle East war. What do you make of the US's response? Joe Biden has been very quiet. Well, Ford Shaker, the uh, uh, the bad guy who at the top of his building was shaved off when he was visiting his mistress um, a couple of nights ago, had a bounty of $5 million on his head, Gabriel, from uh, um, killing of the Marines in the barracks in 1983. So the Americans can hardly condemn the Israelis for doing that. Um, and the Israelis have openly owned that one. But um, uh, they think perhaps that the Israeli tactic of uh, sending Iran um, heavier messages than they, uh, the United States, have sent uh, might be an effective strategy. And they, they would prefer uh, Israel reacting like this to Iran and like they did to the massacre of those children in uh, Migdal Shams by Hezbollah and another Iranian proxy by targeted assassinations. There's no military invasion of South Lebanon uh, that avoided casualties for both the Lebanese and Israelis. And the Americans are probably biting their tongue and saying, well, we'll see how this works out. It beats uh, having a more open scale war. Opposition leader Peter Dutton is in Israel at the moment. He was on Sky News last night speaking about how impacted he was when he visited the site of the Nova Music Festival, Festival massacre, somewhere I visited a couple of months ago, and there's just no words to describe the horrific feeling that is still on the ground. But it's somewhere where our Foreign Minister Penny Wong didn't bother to visit. Uh, Anthony Albanese still hasn't visited Israel. What does that say about Australia's relationship with Israel? Well, for serious people who worry about foreign policy, you've got to start worrying about it. Even Albo's fashionista mate in Canada, uh, Justin Trudeau, uh, has visited there. Albo hasn't been at all. Um, and you pointed uh, to the case of the highly celebrated by the Canberra Press Gallery, Penny Wong, uh, didn't go down there either, so she didn't get a proper feeling for the whole place. Remember, she is consistent in this. She hasn't gone to Ukraine. We don't have an embassy reopened in Ukraine, one of only 53 countries that haven't reopened. I mean, she's celebrated as a brilliant foreign minister by people who don't follow, follow foreign affairs or by their her arm in corner at the ABC. But th this, is, this is bad. This is starting to open uh, a difference between Canada, Australia constantly making statements condemning Israel and London and Washington, who are the other partners of the Five Eyes. If I was um, a Chinese military strategist or uh, um, Xi, uh, uh, Emperor Xi, I would uh, uh, start to see this is an area we could exploit differences between Australia, Canada on the one side and Washington, London on the other. It's very bad. It's childish. Um, Albo should have gone there and, El and Dutton is to be commended for uh, getting the insight that you can only get on the ground. Former Labor MP Michael Danby, thank you so much for joining us on Power Hour. Thanks, Gabri. Joining us is News Corp columnist Angela Mollard. Angela, great to be with you. Let's start with the Olympics. It's always an exciting time for us to rally around our athletes, but it really got off to an uncomfortable start. Mm -hmm. What did you make of the opening ceremony? 
Look, it was a mess. It went for too long. It was so woke. It was out. And you, every time you looked at it, something different was happening. There mm. were minions. There was a menage a trois. There was a repurposing of the Last Supper, supper with um, transvestites. It just felt like they were trying to do too much and to, and to nod to too much about... Uh, I mean, look, it's always about French history and it's always about the country's culture and that sort of thing. But it just felt like it didn't have a story in the way that Sydney or London Absolutely. had a beautiful flowing story that, you know, you could grab it. You found yourself looking at it thinking, what's the reference point here? Too clever by half. I mean, this is the country that is at the forefront of art and culture. Could have done better. 100% agree. And then modern Christianity, I just don't think it went down well. Not at all. And look, if you had attacked Islam like that, I can understand why Christians are really upset about Absolutely. it. Look, you know, the whole Jesus thing about turning the other cheek. Yeah, but that's a passive reaction. This was this hurt a belief system mm -hmm. of, of people, and I just don't think you do that. You couldn't nod to um, the culture of transvestites and diversity without having to situate it, the parody, within The Last Supper. Absolutely. Well said. Let's talk about some of the other issues that Paris is dealing with as it hosts <laughs> this Olympics. There are concerns over the water, uh, the water quality in the scene as a, a men's race had to be postponed because mm, of it. Is that right? That's right. The triathlon. So, of course, they're going to do the swimming element in the Seine. They've had terrible weather, so all the dog poo that is all over the streets of France. And this is the thing. No, Everyone no. thinks France is elegant and gorgeous, this beautiful country with the, where the women are the coolest in the world and they have the loveliest food, but actually it's a pigsty. It's disgusting. I've been, the last time I was there, you just spend your whole time. It's not Emily in Paris. You are not just toppling around <laughs> on your shoes. You are actually trying to navigate the way through the dog poo. So, look, to even think that they spent these, I think it was more than a billion dollars on trying to clean, clean up the river. My goodness. And most city rivers are a pigsty. It's just... You, you know, swim in a pool or find, find an ocean and whatever, just situate it somewhere oh, else. It's not going to work. Yeah, and some of the, the images that I'm seeing of the amount of crowds and they haven't got the security uh, checkpoints organised, that people don't know where they're going, and mm. it just seems like absolute chaos. It's going to make Brisbane look really good. <laughs> yeah, that's good. <laughs> Australia needs a win sometimes, yeah. so we'll be good for Brisbane. But as you mentioned, uh, it's, you know, Paris and France, it's known for its food, but unfortunately for the athletes, <laughs> they're not getting the best food or the food that they might need to perform their best. They've been stuck with vegan menus. That's right. About 60% of the menu at the Athletes' Village is apparently vegan. Now, that's fine if you're having a convention of astrologers and palm readers, but this is the Olympics. Oh they need a hunk of steak. What surprises me about this is, again, it's really woke. What This is the country that brought to us beef bourguignon and, you know, fillet steak and um, boulebas, you know, all these lovely protein-rich dishes, you'd think they'd want to showcase them, wouldn't you? But instead they're being fed these lentil patties and things, which is not going to get you to the um, to, to the world record. So that may be some of the reasons why we're not seeing those numbers in the pool that we were expecting. My because goodness. they're just existing on veggies. No, <laughs> it's not OK. I'll... Uh... Yeah, I can't imagine being an athlete and then you're getting stuck with that. There are reports that that, um, that there were warnings about that that would be the menu, but look, it's certainly not ideal. Mm. Staying on the Olympics, uh, a royal has been spotted there, one that Australia likes to claim, Mary. <laughs> well, lots of royals there, but I love the fact that Princess Mar Mary, our, you know, our royal, she was wearing red and white, so mm -hmm. she was supporting Denmark, but as plenty have said, she, you know, runs green and gold in her veins. I thought this was really lovely. Obviously, the Olympics is really, really important to Mary. It's where she met her husband, Fred, in Sydney in 2000. And I think the fact she went into the Athletes' Village, spoke to them, Anna Mears, obviously, Obviously, was um, quite nervous, she said. Uh, obviously, a former Olympian talked about the fact that she was really nervous, but she was bold enough to invite uh, Princess Mary back to the Athletes' Village if he, she wanted a decent cup of coffee. Amazing. So there's, there's always this, you know, does Italy, does France, who has the best coffee? Or anyone who's travelled in Europe knows Australia has the best coffee. Yeah, absolutely. It's the first thing you want when you get <laughs> off the plane, isn't it? And it is such a good story, isn't it, that we, we bring up every time there's the Olympics, that that is where Fred and Mary met yeah. in Sydney in year 2000. You know, I actually got the story firsthand from King Frederick years ago, and I was the only Australian did at this you? point. I did. I was at a party in Venice, and I was the only Australian, and I said, look, you have to tell me the story. I'm the only Australian. I love Mary so much. And he told me about meeting her, and he said they just talked and talked and talked all night. You and asked I him? I did, firsthand. It was, uh, this was a while ago. It was about 12 years ago. Oh, that's so cool. 
So that's my How story. How did you get to be at that party? Oh, I know. Great question. I'm not at these parties anymore. I was much cooler <laughs> back then. But he was having a great time. He was doing vodka shots. He was kind of the man that was... I suppose, of course, as the VIP, but mm. there was no kind of security around him. People were picking mm. him up and throwing him up in the air. I thought, what is going on? Yeah. It certainly doesn't happen in Australia, although we don't really have royalty in Australia. But yeah. if we have leaders, it, I don't think they're he seems behaving like that. Casual, but you are very lucky get, get, to get that experience. To get the inside scoop. trying to keep that quiet for a long time. She spent a lot of time, obviously, in Denmark, and, you know, very undercover. Like, I remember the first night he dressed up to in the proper, you know, kind of dress uniform to go to a dinner and she suddenly realised what this meant to be royal. She's talked about that yes. subsequently. So you had the inside scoop on that. And we're very <laughs> proud of Mary, aren't we? we she are. just we looks love amazing. Mm. Look, staying on royals, uh, royal has been named as the best dressed person for 2024 and it's not Kate Middleton. It's not. It's Princess Beatrice who of course was mocked roundly over the years for her dress sense, notably the hat that she wore to William and Kate's wedding in 2011. Mm -hmm. It was um, positioned as, uh, it looked like for Lopian tubes. There were so many memes. Well, I think it was before meme time, but it was, you know, like it just was, she was so roundly mocked, her and her sister, for being the worst dressed royal. So this is a, a step up. And she, got, you know, she got a new stylist six years ago. I quite like these best dressed lists because they sort of, yeah, you'll have the royals, but then people like Cruz Beckham, the, the son of um, Victoria and David Beckham, have sort of made these lists. I quite like it. And I, I look, Beatrice looks fantastic. I think mm. the moment she uh, borrowed her grandmother, the late Queen's wedding dress, to wear to her her own wedding. She, of mm. course, slightly adjusted it and repurposed it. I think that she just nails it. At yeah. Ascot recently, she looked fantastic. And, you know, look, part of the royal, you know, in, the interest in the royal is fashion. Absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're icons. And, uh, it's yeah, it's great to see. Look, finally, Buckingham Palace has revealed a new set of royal values, including Stay Curious. Ooh, what's that about? Stay Curious. What are the other ones? Um, lead, Better. You know, there was a whole lot of ones. Um, I think the interesting thing about this is it's, it's a suite of values that uh, focuses on being very modern, quite different from what the Queen would have uh, had as her set of values. It's about leaning in, it's about being together, you know, working together, succeed together. All very well when your family, though, of course, is very splintered. But what I think is really interesting about this is they it, it has taken out one of the paragraphs that used to refer to the fact that all members, all generations of the royal family were useful in terms of being relatable to the public. That's been taken out because, of course, um, King Charles wants a slimmed-down monarchy. I think mm. that's a mistake. You can slim it down too much. We now have two members of the royal family that have cancer. You have yeah. William and Camilla doing all the work. You don't know that, uh, you know, when George comes through, yes, of course, he will be king, but what about Charlotte and Louis? They won't necessarily want to do it. I think the royal family is more visible than it's ever been. They have social media, which is a 24-7 process of, of delivering uh, the work. Which has got them into trouble this year. Has very much got them into trouble, of course, with the photoshopping of, uh, by Kate. I think they actually need more members of the family doing the work. So I think this is an interesting direction that, um, that the new king has. Uh, determined. Okay, well, watch this space. Angela Muller, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Gabriella. And that is Power Hour. Thank you for your company. We'll see you next week. Make sure you subscribe to Sky News Australia on YouTube.